Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, the MSP. This is Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving the extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. A uh, number of different topics today, as per normal. We're going to start with the Chechen fighters in Melitopol. This is something I meant to share with you, I don't know, maybe four days ago or something. When was it from? Uh, the 22nd, yeah, so it's like, goodness me, six days ago. Uh, but I just haven't got round to it, I haven't done uh, enough extras recently. So this is curious situation happening in Melitopol, which is occupied, where commander of the Akhmat Vostok Battalion was apparently uh, stopped at a checkpoint. So there's a Chechen fighter um, uh, in charge of a unit. His paperwork was not up to date. But instead of sorting this out, they nearly shot the serviceman who stopped them. Let's go at and check this out. We're going to dip into it a little bit later uh, and see what, what takes, what transpires. Show your combat order. He gets the paper out. So the Chechen's in the car. This is just a normal checkpoint guard doing his job. Looking at the paperwork. Okay. Fair enough. Reading it. Until which date is it? What? It's unlimited, says the Chechen. Unlimited combat order is considered invalid, he says. I don't give an F. The regimental commander gave it to me. Move your car right, he says. And then he gets out. And then there's... Shoot, shoot for F's sake. And lots of swearing at each other. I'll effing shoot him, you out your effing mind, so on and so forth. And then, you know, swearing like this is the battalion commander, you know, you out your effing mind, uh, you should be stopping other vehicles, so on and so forth. Okay, so that was pretty hairy. I didn't read out all of the, uh, the stuff to you because I wanted you to hear what was going on. Um, that's all pretty hairy stuff. Indeed, uh, this has been reported in a Newsweek piece. Russian Telegram channels are circulating reports of direct clashes between Chechen Kadarovsky militias and Russian regular forces in Melitopol. Calls for Russians to shoot down renegade Chechens are also swirling in ultra-nationalist spaces. Okay, so the Newsweek article is Kadarov's troops clash with Russian soldiers in occupied Melitopol video. And it goes on to talk about it a little bit later in the article. The hot Chechen topic, which cooled down during the New Year holidays, is again rising to the top of the military political agenda, the Post added. So this is something that has been ongoing. Uh, the, the, this is a, a marriage of convenience, I guess, between the Chechens and the Russians. At the end of the day, you've got to remember that the Chechens were invaded by the Russians and then Ramzan Kadyrov, you know, switched sides and... They were able, Second Chechen War, they were able to capitulate, I guess, to the Russians or, or, or work with the Russians. But there's going to be a lot of Chechens inside uh, Chechnya who aren't big fans of Russia. And there's going to be a, a number of Chechens who are, I guess, pro-Russian, fighting for the Russians. But it, it is not like... Not like a Russian fighting for Russia and being ultra-nationalist and fighting. There's, there's going to be issues arising, not least, you know ethnic issues between different groups of, of you know, Russians and, say, Chechens. Uh, being, being that the Chechens are broadly Muslim. Um, any, anyway, it's coming to the top of the mil military political ag agenda, says this Telegram post. Subsequent developments, the channel said, will reveal a lot about the current tensions developing between the Chechen and the Russian comrades, says Newsweek. The ultra-nationalist Varenka Telegram, so a mill blogger Telegram channel, uh, posted an angry reaction to the video. Quote, it is impossible not to react to this, the popular blogger wrote. That this is a direct challenge. Are these exactly the defenders who are entrusted to protect the people of the Russian world? Uh, the 13th channel, meanwhile, went as far as to call for violent retribution. 13th is a big, like, pro-Russian telegram channel. 
The channel said that Russian soldiers manning checkpoints should face down armed Chechens. If, quote, there is a threat to your life, then you need to take your machine gun off the safety and discharge it into an ugly bearded face. The post said, referring to the characteristic full beards worn by Muslim Chechen fighters. Tensions have long existed between uh, regular Russian units and Chechen formations under the control of Ramzan Kadyrov. His Chechen is pro-Kremlin strongman, whom Moscow allows to rule the North Caucasus. Uh, Republic, uh, Caucasus Republic as a personal fiefdom in exchange for loyalty to President Vladimir Putin. Uh, Kadyrov's rule has enabled Moscow to quiet the rest of region. Chechnya played host to two brutal successionist conflicts in the 1990s and 2000s, the second of which was overseen by Putin. Kadyrov's father, Ahmad Kadyrov, who was assassinated in 2004, fought the Kremlin in the first Chechen war, but switched sides to back Moscow in the second. So it's the father that switched sides and then died and then Ramzan Kadyrov took over. It, Ramzan Kadyrov sent his forces to Ukraine early in the full-scale Russian invasion of the country. However, the Chechen units were widely mocked by the Ukrainians and the Russians alike for their performative but ineffective showings in combat. Such behaviour won them the TikTok Battalion nickname, a reference to the many social media videos produced by the Chechen fighters. So that's... What can I say? Good. Long may that continue. Long may these issues and tensions between Russian soldiers and Chechen fighters uh, go on because this is all good for the Ukrainians. Um, okay, on to a different uh, subject here. And this is a difficult subject for Ukraine, for the Ukrainians and for, for the politicians in, well, politicians and military leaders, as this article spells out. I've talked to you before about how mobilization is the, the biggest challenge for the Ukrainians. They need boots on the ground. That's one of the, the most uh, desperate needs they have. But with that, if you are to mobilize 450,000 people, men predominantly, what is that going to do to your society, to your economy, um, to, you, to your country in so many different ways? That's the dilemma that Zelensky has. And I think some people I've heard, Andrew Perpetua, for example, be, be really stinging in his rebuke of, uh, I think he was in um, his rebuke of Zelensky, like they need boots on the ground. This is the one thing they need. My position is is a little bit more... I guess, understanding of the challenge Zelensky has. I mean, of course, if if he could mobilise 450,000 people like that and it had no effect on anything in his country, then he would do that, right? But the reason is, why isn't he doing that? And of course, it's because it would, it, it would have tremendous effect on the country, negative effect. Positive effect militarily, negative effect economically. And of course, it's the economy that is... is the foundation for the war, right? So, you know, you, you rob the economy and put them into the army, then you've got no money coming in to support the army. Anyway, Ukraine struggles to ramp up mobilization as Russia's war enters a third year. So uh, this article in Kiev Independent is very good. I'm just going to dip into bits and pieces so it may be a bit truncated in areas or the flow might be a bit distorted. With it comes the most difficult internal challenges that Ukraine faces in this war, balancing the need to defend a country's independence from an existential threat with the painful reality of having to take hundreds of thousands of, civil of civilians, taxpayers, fathers, brothers, husbands and sons off to war. Although Ukraine has been conducting rolling mobilisations since the full-scale invasion began in 2022, the topic soared to the top of the domestic agenda on the 19th of December when Zelensky announced at a press conference that the military had requested the mobilization of an additional 450 to 500,000 conscripts. So, you know, Zeluzhny, the military want that many people. Zelensky has to either give them that many people or give them good reason why they can't have that many people or arrive at some compromise. Quote, the president understands perfectly well that if he doesn't give the green light to mobilization, soon there will be nobody to fight with. Military political analyst and co-founder of the Information Resistance Project, Alexander Kovalenko, told the Kiev Independent. A week later, a new draft law on mobilization was submitted by Ukraine's cabinet of ministers to the Verkhovna Rada, the country's parliament. Inside the 72-page document were measures seeking not only to expand the groups of Ukrainian men eligible for the draft, but also to increase consequences for avoiding it. So it's like, okay... You're going to be mobilized. There's there's a wide wider remit or wider range of people that we can mobilize now. We've changed the age brackets. We you know, and other things possibly as well. Uh, but also, if you escape um, mobilization, then there'll be harsher punishments for you. And and that has gone back. That's been gone back for amendments, and it is being argued in Parliament at the moment. There there are a number of different versions of the proposed law that are floating about but it is as it goes on to say an unavoidable need uh it talks about a particular kind of training group 
I think getting people ready for maybe mobilization. Um, quote, at first everyone wanted to fight and there weren't enough weapons, but now it's clear that initial fire is gone. If it was still there, the situation on the battlefield would be easier for everyone. By now, both Russia and Ukraine are fighting with armies dominated by mobilized soldiers, the scale of one of the most brutal state against state wars since Second World War, War demands it. Now, this is the idea that those people who really have that fire in the belly, as, as I kind of mentioned there, that want to go and fight for Ukraine will already have gone to the front line, will already be fighting or will already have perished. So now you've got to a pool of people within Ukraine who are either not fit enough but want to, uh, or too old but want to, too young but want to, um, and or, or, or don't want to. Um, many of them not wanting to do that, and that is a challenge. It's not that they're against the war. It's not that they're anti-Ukraine. It's just that they are, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll support Ukraine in all the ways I can, but I just don't want to go and put my body on a line and most probably not live out my contract. That is a very real challenge. Um, the article continues, much less territory changed hands in 2023 compared to 22, but at the same time, the intensity of fighting has only steadily increased as the two sides commit more and more resources to the struggle that is of existential importance both for Vladimir Putin's imperial vision as it is for Ukraine as a nation. In this context, Ukraine's need to mobilize hundreds of thousands more soldiers over 2024 is objectively clear, as reflected in the 450 to 500,000 number initially voiced by Zelensky. Newly mobilized soldiers are required both to refill the ranks of units that have suffered casualties in the intense fighting and to create fresh reserves, which can be used either for future offensive or to rotate units that have been exhausted after long stints at the front line. With no current expiry date on the military contracts of mobilized Ukrainians, huge problem that has been voiced a number of times, calls for soldiers' eventual demobilization have become louder recently. The demobilization is the idea that like, I've served two years on a military contract. Thank you. I, 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 that's enough. I need to go and just recuperate and get on with my life. If you need me again, maybe, you know, that can happen at a future date, but two years is enough for me now as a human being. I'm done. But they haven't put that that end point on many of these contracts by the by the looks of it. And so there's a the these there are these big calls for Ukraine to be far more transparent, with the army and the armed forces to be far more transparent in the terms of the contracts. But, you know, is it just until the war is over? Um, the initial draft law presented by the cabinet of ministers called for contracts to be sent set at 36 months. That's three years, which is obviously, you know, if you if you start at the beginning of the year, you've now got another one year to go. While alternative proposals from opposition parties set the number as low as 18 months. In any case, the mobilized soldiers themselves will have to be replaced with more conscripts, as originally noted at his press conference in December. So it goes on to discuss those challenges. But the, there is a tricky compromise to be had as it as it continues later. Quote, I also want to defend civilians for one second, he later added. So this is Zelensky. Uh, when we are talking about mobilization, it takes, and this is so key, right? And this is the problem he has in his head. And th this is your comeback to anyone saying, well, just mobilize, right? It takes six civilians paying taxes to provide for one fighter. Wow. So if you're taking six civilians away, uh, then that's that's one fighter that that can't be provided for. Uh, that is, uh, sorry, yeah. So that is incredible. Uh, you know, it it yeah. Later in an interview with Channel Four, published on January the twentieth, Zelensky once again argued that five hundred thousand figure would be too much so just to do some quick maths if that was four hundred fifty thousand tr troops mobilized or, or civilians mobilized then that would be paying for those four hundred fifty thousand people would be paying for seventy five thousand troops but suddenly uh, that's that's not being financed but it is worse than that because of course those jobs aren't being f filled and done and you know there, there's society would start falling apart administratively or in terms of sectors, different sectors really struggling to operate, 
uh, defense military industrial complex. I know there's been talk about ring fencing certain employees in the military industrial complex because it's that important. You don't want to mobilize people out of there and then not be able to build the weapons that, that the army needs to use. So there's so much to to consider when when mobilizing. It's not just the case of we need 500,000 people, so let's just take them from the population. Uh, and then, of course, for, for all of those, for each 100,000 people you mobilize, how many people are running away out of the country? How many are trying to escape? Um, so these comments uh, established the ground rules for the passing of new mobilization legislation. This was to be a compromise between the military and their clear need for laws to help them expand the mobilization process and the civilian leadership looking to protect the interests of civilians from outwardly draconian or unconstitutional measures. Quote, this draft law needs to take shape through tight cooperation between the country's military and political leadership, said Kovalenko. This is a very difficult discussion because often politicians don't understand military matters and vice versa. So military personnel don't understand the political ramifications. And that's, you know, as the both, I, I, I guess, effectively the military leader, well, he's not, as the solution he is, but, you know, Zelensky is in charge of the country and he, he has that kind of political hat on. And then he has to wear, oftentimes, the military hat. And, and it's difficult to balance these two roles and to balance the, the two sets of arguments for mobilization or against mobilization from from the wearing of each of those hats the initial draft law contained several key measures to standardize and widen the scope for mobilization most of which were quickly contested in parliamentary committees these including the lowering of the draft age from 27 to 25 with basic military service compulsory between 18 and 25 the removal of exemption for men in the least severe disability group again you know making people who are unfit to fight fit to fight, it's certainly in the least severe disability group, the involvement of local government in the conscription process and the addition of draft dodgers to the debtors register. Um, and you could argue possibly, you know, drafting in more women to the front line would be uh, a something to do as well. Um, so on and so forth. There, there is then fear on the streets as people are worried about getting, you know, picked off by enlistment officers. There are all these scare stories of of people being bundled into vans but of course the reality is that if you have escaped draft you know that's a legal requirement then you you know you if you are found you will be rounded up in the same way that if you're a murderer right and you've escaped you know being sentenced you've escaped going to trial and you, you're out on a run if the police find you they're going to take you down put handcuffs on you and whack you in the back of a van well, actually, you know, escaping draft is a very sort of similar thing. You, you, it's against the law or the regulations of the country. And so, although there are all these scare stories about people being bundled into into the back of a van, isn't that terrible that people with like kerchiefs are coming around or snoods or whatever coming around and and you know dragging people into vans? Oh, that's horrible. That's the reality. I mean, how else would you do it, do it? Well, have them walk up and say, "Why, verily, forsooth, would you not like to?" And take a step into this here van and they go uh no thank you very much i'm gonna walk away and you go oh that's terribly unkind of you but no you're gonna to to say mate if you don't get in a van we're gonna drag you in a van so you've got a choice you either get in a van willingly or we're gonna put you in handcuffs and whack you in there you know they're, they're, it's it's not nice is it but they need these people to go to war they set a regulation in place that x y and z people are drafted to the war and if they refuse to do so you've got to do something about it many men eligible for the draft subscribe to local telegram channels that warn residents of where summons notices are being handed out according to one local enlistment officer in the northern ukrainian city of chernihiv over 21,000 locals are subscribed to such a channel in the city as of july 2023 roughly equivalent to the number of those who have dodged the draft I and mean, there's an awful lot of people who have dodged the draft right um and and the well, army needs them Quote, I don't go out into uh, onto the street at all, said Mikhailo, a 31-year-old resident of the western Ukrainian city of Chernitsi, whose name has been changed to protect his identity. For Mikhailo, an IT specialist who says he regularly donates to the armed forces through trusted fundraisers, the choice to remain at home is driven by surreal double motivation to avoid not only being drafted on the street, but also moral guilt of enjoying oneself outside as a military aged male. So it's this idea that, look, I've been drafted um, and I don't want to go to war. I feel really guilty about that. So I stay inside 
um, because I don't want to be caught out on the streets. And also, I don't want to be going out having fun, going to bars and having my normal social life when there are people fighting on the front line for my ability to do that. So I'm going to stay at home um, and then I'm going to do fundraising at home and, and so on and so forth in, in order to, to stop myself from you know, feeling so much guilt um, and, and to keep myself safe. Uh, so it's really interesting. Um, anyway, just to go on to, to a much later part of the article in the No Other Option segment. Quote, we don't have months or years to discuss this. Our enemy continues to attack and we must take steps to ensure the rotation of the people who have been defending the country for two years already. With battlefield prospects darkening and internal politics returning with a vengeance, the way Ukraine grapples with the challenge of mobilization looks to serve as a litmus test for the country's ability to handle the enduring pressure of the war as a whole. It's not a conflict of interests. It's a conflict of worldviews, says Kovalenko. The military understands very well what war is and how it could end for the country, while many civilians have gotten used to this new ordinary life and don't want to face the reality that everyone needs to be ready to fight. End quote. Ultimately, so long as Russia continues to attack and Ukraine continues to resist, the reality of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian civilian men must enter the ranks of the military is unavoidable. Quote, a lot of people don't understand, don't quite understand the need for mobilization. Maybe they think that the war is far away and that they, the military, can manage fine. Kovalenko added, uh, they don't think about what could happen to the country, to the country if they don't manage. It's... Rock and hard place is such a difficult subject. There's such such a difficult process. The final thing I'm going to talk about today, actually, I'll, I'll cut it a bit shorter. Um, problems at Russian oil refineries have become systemic. Systemic. This is Anton Gerashenko talking about uh, Ukraine's strategy to hit Russian oil depots and refineries. Now, bear in mind, Russia did that to Ukraine last night in a big old way, and a, there's a oil refinery or storage plant or depot that has been. Uh, in Kremenchuk that's you know, been blazing away. But anyway, he says, due to drone strikes and technological problems at refineries, fuel production is decreasing, which leads to an increase in prices in Russia, not just for fuel, but also for food, because the price rise is scheduled to occur before the sowing season. Chronicle of burning depots in Russia since the beginning of 2024. So on the 1st, oh, sorry, on the 8th of January, uh, an explosion in Nizhny Tagil, Sverdlovsk region, on railroad tracks near San Donato Station, local media reported that explosives were attached to the tank cars of the train belonging to Gazprom Trans. And the fact that the explosion occurred near Gazprom Neft facilities also caused a stir. On the 9th, the kamikaze drone crashed into the tank of an Oriol Neft product oil depot in Oriol region. On the 18th, the drone debris was found on the territory of Petersburg Oil Terminal in Leningrad region. The first drone attack on Leningrad region since the beginning of the full-scale war. On the 19th, a small drone caused a large-scale fire at an oil depot in Klinsky, Bryansk region. According to experts, this is an important transit hub for transportation of fuel and lubricants to the needs for the needs of the Russian troops. The fire was extinguished only after midnight on the 21st. Four fuel tanks with a total weight of more than 3,100 tonnes burned. On the 21st, a drone attack on the port of Ust-Luga in Leningrad region. Two explosions occurred at the Novotek oil terminal, so that's St. Petersburg area. This fuel complex is a key link in the energy infrastructure, providing processing of gas condensate and production of oil products for export to Asia. On the 24th, after a drone strike, a fire broke out at the Tuapse oil refinery in Krasnodar region, so that's on the Black Sea. The Tuapse refinery is one of the 10 largest refineries in Russia. Moreover, it is the only Russian refinery on the Black Sea coast. And so, you know, we can see the Ukrainians stepping up their attempts to uh, hammer the Russian infrastructure. Not only will that affect Russia's ability to provide fuel for its forces and, and hit the economy in a way that could produce, you know, protests and whatever, you know, if done enough, but, but also it has a knock-on effect of the Russians then thinking, well, we need to protect all these oil refineries with decent air defence systems and so they're having to spread their air defense systems even thinner on the ground or take them away from the front line maybe to go and protect oil reserves and then that leaves weaknesses elsewhere remember the old analogy of of having a bed with a blanket that's too small for the bed and every time you pull the blanket in one direction it exposes somewhere else and that's the situation with air defenses in russia not just about air defenses for the front line in the occupied territories it's about air defenses inside russia all over russia with drones that can now go to 1,250 kilometers, the Russians need to be thinking very, very um, seriously about how well they defend their, their different infrastructures within Russia. And that, of course, 
you know, is a good problem for the for the Russians to have as far as the Ukrainians are concerned. Um, anyway, uh, thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate your support. Please like, subscribe and share. I'm going to work on my members list. Thanks that go at the end of the videos. It's a bit out of date. I know there are different members now. Thank you for your support, members. You are what uh, partly what allows me to keep doing this. And I really, really appreciate you. Take care, everybody. Toodle pips.